10. It's a few minutes after the hour. So, um, uh, hi everyone. This is Heidi Notari, and I'm the Training and Technical Assistance Coordinator at Casa Esperanza. And I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar today as we present part three of Assessing Patterns of Coercive Control. And this webinar is presented by our colleagues from the Northwest Network of Bisexual, Transgender, Lesbian, and Gay Survivors of Abuse. I uh, am very happy to have our colleagues with us today, and I'm also kind of sad that this is the last of the series, but as they said, we can do this again and share information as we continue working together and supporting all of you in your work. Before I turn it over to the presenters today, I would like to invite everyone again to please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. That helps us know where you're calling from and the kind of work that you do. So that's really helpful. And you'll see that the presenters will pose some questions for you to continue participating on the chat. Thanks to those of you who already introduced yourselves. Uh, also, I would like to ask you, if you haven't done so, to please join the National Latino Network for Healthy Families and Communities. Joining the NLN is a very simple process. You can do that on our website, and that's nationallatinonetwork.org. And um, when you join the network, you will receive regular updates around policy, training announcements such as this one, and anything related to um, public policy, especially very important in light of comprehensive immigration reform and everything else that uh, affects immigrant survivors. So without any more delays, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters today. They are Kristen Tucker and Amarintia Torres. Welcome both. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, Amarintia, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. My name is Amarintia Torres. I'm the Community Advocacy Program Manager here at the Northwest Network um, here in Seattle. And I am uh, just excited to be here. And um, I think last time I said as well, I see Hospitality House is here again. And I used to do uh, advocacy work in Rome, Georgia, and other parts of the South as well. So I started out doing sexual assault advocacy, um, and then also did some uh, domestic violence advocacy in Atlanta. So I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, Amarinthia. Um And thanks so much, Casa, for having us. And thanks so much, all of you, for being here with us today on this final session of our three-part assessment series. Um, so we're super excited to be here um, with all of you today. So my name is Kristen Tucker, and I work here at the Northwest Network uh, coordinating our national training and technical assistance work. Um, and I've been at the organization for almost 11 years now, primarily providing support, advocacy, and training around working with LGBTQ survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And so the work that we're doing here um, in sharing our um, tool and model as well as approach around assessment is rooted in our experience um, serving LGBTQ communities. Um, and we also know that this is an approach that is beneficial across the board in, in providing really comprehensive and holistic services to all survivors of interpartner violence. And so we're excited to be sharing um, our examples, which is really rooted in LGBTQ experience. And we welcome your thoughts and questions about how this might um, kind of intersect with concerns and issues for survivors in your own communities. And so I'm going to give you just a little bit of a heads up um, about what we're going to be spending our time on today, and then we're going to jump right in. And so um, I'm actually going to ask this question quickly. Um, so if folks know where your hand is to raise, it's up on the upper left corner of your screen, um, could you raise your hand and let us know if you participated in an earlier assessment webinar training with the Northwest Network? I often like to give a little bit of time for folks to raise their tiny computer hands. <laughs> yeah, so just about half, maybe a little bit less. So um, for those of you that have not participated um, in uh, one of the earlier sessions here through this series for class grantees or uh, a previous session for the Northwest Network, it's just fine. Um, and we are going to be jumping in um, and kind of getting in depth to a little bit more of the practical application aspects of the assessment tool. The first two sessions we really focused on building a broad analysis of why is assessment an important part of our work in the anti-violence field, specifically in working with marginalized survivors. 
and then going into some of the um, ways in which we orient our organizations and our practices around um, engaging in this process, people who reach out for support. And then we'll be spending some time today really talking about what the tool looks like, doing some role plays where you can observe Amarinthia and myself kind of doing simulated assessments, and then you'll have a chance to ask questions and give us feedback. And then we'll talk a little bit about some um, kind of organizational considerations and next steps for folks as they work towards integrating some manner of um, this tool or this analysis into the services you're providing every day. Awesome. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and get us started um, with a little bit of a review. So for folks who were already on the previous webinars, um, this will be a little refresher. And for folks who weren't able to join us on the previous ones, um, this will be just kind of a quicker, a little bit of overview of all that content from the first two uh, webinars before. But we want to jump right in and get us going with the chat function here, some time to chat in your chat boxes. So one of the things we wanted to um, talk about is this uh, behavior right here. So hits wall next to where partner is standing. How, how in your experience, how has someone battering been able to use that behavior to maintain a pattern of power and control or exploitation? So what are some of the things that you've noticed in your experience about someone hitting a wall um, where they're next to where the partner is standing? How might that be used to batter someone? You can just type that in your chat box down there at the bottom. Um, it's either going to be at the bottom corner of your screen or the right-hand side. Okay. Is that intimidation, so being able to get what they want, showing their will willingness to use violence, that they may escalate that violence, um, that they're capable of that and maybe even more, right? Um, that this could be you, right? That this wall, I'm going to bust this wall up and I have no problem if that was going to be something that I would do to your face or to do to your body. So to scare someone, absolutely. Um, those are all great examples. So the next slide is going to be a similar idea. So you're going to be answering the same question. But instead, think about how that same behavior might be used to survive a pattern of power and control. How might someone who's surviving battering use that same behavior? And what would be the reasons for using that behavior? What are some things that come to mind from your experiences? Yeah, so maybe they're frustrated, someone duly says, to express frustration. Mm -hmm to maybe distract the batterer, right? So maybe, maybe the person who's battering is trying to harm their pet. Maybe they're trying to harm, maybe they're fighting with the kids. And so maybe the survivor is really trying to just redirect, right, and get that attention somewhere else. And, and hits the, hitting the wall might be startling and might do that. Um, yeah, so exactly, distraction to give the kids time to get safe, to show that they are strong too. Yeah, to not feel like they're always being victimized in some way or that they're vulnerable, but to show that they can react as well. Um, and Wendy also says to give themselves a few seconds to get to safety, so to buy some time um, using that kind of shock appeal to be able to do that. Those are great examples, folks, of thinking about how that same behavior can be used to, sur to survive. And one of the things that we've really learned in our work with survivors, um, particularly LGBT survivors, is that we can't rely on gender in the same ways that we might if we were working with straight folks. We know that when you're talking about heterosexual relationships, majority of the time, um, because of sexism, because of patriarchy, because of all the things we know, um, very often men are the ones who are battering women um, at significantly higher rates than we see the other way around. And so when we have same-sex survivors um, or same-sex couples, we can't rely on just that one factor alone um, to determine who's actually creating a pattern of power and control. And we also can't rely on a list of behaviors. Um, so we know that any behavior can, virtually any behavior can be used to survive abuse or can be used to create a pattern of power and control. And so we have to be looking a, look, a bit broader than just those two things to determine who's actually surviving a pattern of power and control. And so in the last few at webinars, we've talked a lot about this idea of a movie versus a snapshot. So sort of that idea of zooming out, getting this fuller picture about what's happening that isn't just this list of behaviors or gender, but is actually getting this 360 view about what's been going on in the relationship. Um, and so we want to know not just the incident that happened in just this one moment in time, but we really want to think about what was happening before. What was happening during the fight? What happened after that argument? Or what happened after the person hit the wall next to the, where the survivor was standing? Um, we want to really get, be getting that larger picture, that larger idea of what's been happening in the relationship. Um, and that gives us a lot more context about what's been going on. Um, yeah, thanks, Amarinthia. Yeah, sure. I'm going to give a. I'm actually just going to give a little bit of an example. Um, just it's an example that Connie used probably in the first session that I think actually might be really helpful considering um, we got a, a quite a 
chunk of folks who weren't in um, the earlier sessions. Um, so this idea of movie versus a snapshot, it's something where we really are trying to figure out ways to not just kind of launch into action when we get a little bit of information and try to fit that into something that's consistent with the survivor's experience, right? So we're often like listening to these for these very particular cues about someone having experienced violence or someone feeling afraid, and then we're often kind of moving into action in a response to that as opposed to gathering that bigger picture like what Amarinthia was saying, kind of zooming out and trying to get more details. And so Connie um, shares this example that I think is really helpful um, from one of her kind of early conversations with someone who called at the network. Um, and this person was saying, you know, I feel really freaked out. I um, was trying to leave the house last night and my partner put her hands on me and tried to keep me from leaving. Right? So how many of you have had, raise your hand, have had a conversation with someone that started out that way? I was trying to leave and someone physically prevented me from leaving. Right, so the hands are going up, actually pretty high numbers, right? So a lot of us have probably had that very exact conversation with someone where they're like, I tried to go and someone, you know, shoved me out of the way of the door or grabbed me and didn't let me leave. That's something that's very consistent kind of in, a, in, a, in that snapshot with someone who's surviving, right? And so because we were engaging in this more comprehensive assessment process, Connie knew the next steps were to try to get a little bit more information, right? Get that movie like Amarinthia was saying. And so she asked that person, tell me a little bit about what was going on when you were trying to leave last night, trying to build more of a sense of, of the context at the time. And the person said, well, I was trying to leave because I wanted to go to the basement, and the basement door is on the outside of the house. And Connie's like, okay, so what, what were you hoping to do in the basement? And the caller said, you know, my partner is responsible for doing the laundry, and the laundry room is in the basement. And I go down there, and I check on the laundry, and if she doesn't do it right, I throw it on the ground, and I make her do it again. Really different story. <laughs> <laughs> so as I'm sure some of you might be thinking right now, whoa, that is very different in a situation than what it sounded like at the outset, right? So that is a really, really different situation that we get from getting more information, right? And that's really the premise of what we're doing here, you know, in assessing for a pattern of coercive control versus an incident or harm or violence. Because you can imagine if Connie just responded to that very first um, kind of statement from that caller, we would have responded organizationally in a very different way and wouldn't have actually gotten that person who was later assessed to be battering their partner connected to the resources that are actually going to help them make better choices to stop harming people they're in relationships with. Right? And that's really the heart of this tool is not just to like keep the bad people out and the good people in, right? but it's also to say like in our communities, right, we are wanting to make sure people get the support they need. And that means survivors, access to advocacy and support, and for folks that are battering their partners, access to some meaningful services and interventions that are going to help them do something different. And so it's important for us to try to start that unpacking and stay in that um, kind of skill set of, of being open to the full spectrum of, of people's experiences and survivors' experiences. So we're looking again here for a pattern, not just uh, you know, who did what, and when, right? We're looking how does this fit together? How does this um, kind of look consistent or inconsistent with um, our experiences of, of the movement definition of domestic violence? I like to use that little highlighter. I like it. Yeah, the purple. <laughs> you can feel free whenever I'm talking, Amaranthia, if you want to highlight anything. Okay. It reminds me of those little, um, I think like when computers were starting yeah. to happen, it was like that little spray paint can on that very tiny computer screen in school. I totally remember that, yep. Um, so anyway, there's an aside. We're enjoying the little highlighter. Um, but this is a piece here that I think builds really um, importantly off of the movie versus the snapshot. And I just wanted to take a moment um, to say something I was going to say earlier and I forgot to say, which is, yes, we're absolutely going to send all of you a copy of our slides. And secondly, um, those of you that were on a previous session likely received from me a copy of the Network's Assessment Tool and the Network's Assessment Tool Instructions. Um, I'm going to resend that out to everyone just in case um, to make sure you all have it because this piece here on context, intent, and effect, there's actually a lot of really, really good information in the instructions that goes into a lot more depth. So we don't have time to do that right now, um, but I just wanted to let you know like, that's a really good place to get back to this idea. So in our process of assessment, advocates are consistently engaging in a process of ongoing, depthful conversation with folks who are calling. So notice I'm not saying survivors because we don't actually know. 
when someone calls us, they could be calling us for any number of reasons, um, that we are trying to engage context, intent, and effect of particular behaviors, agreements, and events. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about the areas in the assessment tool. And what this means, context, intent, and effect, is that we're looking for information that's going to help us get that bigger picture. So context is really looking at what was happening you know, immediately before. So that example I was sharing about the laundry room, so the context was that this person, however many years and times they had gone down and kind of humiliated and, and controlled their partner by making them you know, repeatedly do the laundry over and over again, that context was important, right? So what was happening immediately before an incident? What happened after? Is this the first time that's ever happened? Is it happening with increasing escalation and regularity? We all know that that's really important information. Intent is a, an equally important piece, this sense of really getting a, um, a perspective from the individual if it's something they did. So if a survivor, a person who's calling saying, I hit the wall next to where my partner was standing, I would want to get a sense of what they were hoping would happen as a result of them hitting the wall. Is it I wanted to scare the crap out of them so they knew never to talk to their ex ever again? Or was it because, you know, I'm trying to do that thing where I'm going to get you to pay attention to this so I can get my kids and my pets and myself to safety? Those are two really different intents. And that's going to give us a really different sense of whether someone is surviving or whether someone might be establishing a pattern of coercive control. And the effect piece is really also looking at both what happens after an, an initial incident, but also what the effect is on that big picture of the relationship. Those of us who have done advocacy for you know, more than I don't know, two weeks understand that someone doesn't have to be in constant crisis or in experiencing constant violence for the threats of earlier violence to still have weight, right? that they impact someone's choices, the sense of if I step out of line, these lines I can't even see and I can't even anticipate, something really bad is going to happen. Right? That, that doesn't mean that that is happening every time, but the effect often is for survivors that their range of choices is limited over time. And that for people who are abusing their partners, they have the same access to resources, to choice, and to support, or even potentially greater access to that. Right? And that effect is something that we're looking in the moment and big picture. And Amrit will talk more about that soon. Yeah, and so one of the ways that we kind of mentioned that exact thing that Kristen was talking about is this idea of local and global, right? So what's happening right in that situation, in that moment, right then, as well as the bigger picture of how have things changed over time. So these are just a few questions that kind of roll out some of that thinking. Um, the questions around, you know, whose life has become smaller. So when you think about someone's life and, and how you might want your partner's life to grow and try new things and have new experiences and new friends and new communities, you know, has that, has that decreased? Has that actually been minimized or isolated in some way? Um, and so these, you know, these other questions too around who's actually disappearing from community spaces. So are folks feeling like they aren't able to access the same places that they used to to seek, seek out community or to be with other people um, that have similar identities to them perhaps? Um, and who's had less control over their own choices over time? So, so some of what Kristen was sharing around um, who's not able to really make decisions about their own life anymore. Um, and some of these questions are going to help get at some of that larger picture um, and help us keep in mind not just the immediate needs that are happening right there in the relationship, you know, the day-to-day -day things, but also um, is going to help our advocacy around, well, if someone is surviving and we have seen that their life is becoming smaller, what are the advocacy tasks that we can help build that back, right, and help get that person more connected um, to supports that are going to make sense for them. So we're constantly in our assessment process, and as we're talking about this, really trying to keep a balance between those specific incidences and the cumulative effect of that. So this is just a slide that helps explain a little bit more about um, keeping that balance as well as this helps us really understand that patterned 24-7 nature of battering um, by holding both of these things, the who, what, when, and where of a specific incident, but also the broader impact and the broader um, overall effect on the whole relationship. Um, so those are a few things that help keep in mind. Thanks, Amarinthia. Um, and I, I just added this into the chat, but I wanted to say it out loud in case you're um, maybe multitasking. Um, feel free at any point if you have a question or a clarification. Aida um, asked a really great and important question 
um, that Amaranthia responded to, feel free to just type it in. And you know, we take turns paying attention to the chat when we're not actively talking. Um, and it's really helpful for us to be able to respond as we go through. We will have a little bit of time at the end, but um, we'll do our best to respond to questions either verbally um, or individually to um, folks in the chat. So thanks for that. Um, so our last kind of review um, around assessment before we get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of the tool um, is this idea about debriefing. And so this is um, a, an idea and a practice for us that is very intentionally integrated into our work. So one of the things we know is that, that this process of assessment is not a scientific formula. right? There is no exact you know, specifications that you would be able to meet and then you would without fail foolproof and with 100% assurance be properly assessing every single person. We are human people and it is a human process and it is, it is a guideline and a framework more than it is something that we can kind of input like they had they seven have. yes answers and three no answers beep boop bop, here we are, this person is a survivor, you know, that, that it's, and it, it can be frustrating though because we want something that is more certain because, you know, many of us I'm sure have experienced people will do a lot of things to try to make sense of their experience. They will do a lot of things to try to get access to some really basic needs things, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people lie to you and that is also a human thing that people do. Um, and so for us, it's important to be aware that like we are people doing this process, even with a lot of skill and a lot of practice, we need support. And so the process of debriefing is really oriented to not only giving an opportunity for advocates and direct service staff to be able to process and integrate the kind of trauma we are exposed to, all of the really sad and scary uh, stories we hear every day, um, but it's also to, uh, to ensure that we're doing our best work via this assessment, that we are really getting um, feedback from peers, that we are really aware that we can't do everything by ourselves and that we bring our own stories, our own strengths, our own challenges into the process. Um, one of the things that I think is a, a helpful orientation around debriefing, so for our work, we regularly, for folks who are in the assessment process, we'll debrief with a colleague or in one of our more formal um, contexts with a supervisor, so Amaranthia manages our CAP team. Um, and then we have regular opportunities in a um, kind of group support and supervision for folks to do that as well as in our staff meeting. And we do that because we know that the person that's on the phone with the caller is doing a lot at one time. Right? We're trying to communicate warmth and compassion, right? that we are uh, you know, a sympathetic ear, whether, regardless of whether someone is surviving or not, that we are a place that cares about people, that we are curious and in gathering information without you know, being judgmental or you know, asking people too many questions in a rude way, um, and that we're also trying to synthesize the information that they're sharing with us and fit it into this movie, right? And, and use that context, intense, and effect framework to understand, to ask follow-up questions and clarification. And so you know, on the, for those of you that are familiar with the National Domestic Violence Hotline, one of the things we learned from them is that they regularly drop in on calls. And what that means is you know, you're on a call talking to someone and then all of a sudden someone is listening, like a supervisor or a peer. Um, and they're not, you know, people often are like, oh, I don't want someone to hear me, right? Because what if I make a mistake? Or what if I don't ask the question they think that they would ask in that moment? And what they say is, like, being on that call and listening to the call are two separate things, right? You actually cannot and probably would not have had those thoughts of like, oh, here's my brilliant question that I'm just, you know, formulating as we're, as I'm listening, because you're not having to manage your tone and the rapport and the pace and making sure that someone is having the space to process if they're you know, upset or crying on the phone, right? And so there's a role for each, right? There's a role for someone saying like, oh, I, how about asking this? Or what about that area? That it's not that you aren't a good advocate or you're not awesome at your job, but that you actually need that kind of structured support um, to share information and to get feedback as you go into this ongoing process. And so for us, debriefing is not just 
letting go of the information. It's not just venting, all of which are good and important things. Um, it's a crucial part of the process to ensure that we are doing our best work possible. And so you know, if you're curious after the session to talk a little bit more about you know, what does this consultation work look like for you guys, and how did you build this into your organization so that it's possible, many of you probably work by yourself, um, answer a hotline off hours, and that makes it harder. And so feel free to reach out for us uh, for um, a conversation with us about um, any of the questions that you might have about how to make that happen. So any last questions any of you all have, or Amaranthia, anything you want to say before we jump into the next section? Um, hmm. Well, I'll give a little minute just for questions um, so folks can type those in. There's sometimes a little bit of a delay for the chat, so I'll give a little bit of a moment for that. But one thing I kind of was thinking or that came yeah. to mind um, is just that that part about debriefing is also so helpful to be able to be communicating with other advocates, particularly for us. One, one way that that's the most helpful is that we, um, you know, we may have someone calling who is, we may have two people calling that are in relationship together, and um, you know, one person's call, they're both calling us for survivor services or for support, and so the debriefing part of that really helps us be aware that we have both people in the relationship calling and that we're both needing to, that, that, that two assessments are happening at the same time potentially. Um, and so that's just another thing that um, you know, we have seen the benefit of being able to communicate with each other and you know, be able to um, track that um, so that we are aware that you know, we are working with both people in mm -hmm. this relationship and needing to assess what's going on in it. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Amarinth. And I think that, that the point that you just made is, is of particular importance to those of us that are working in smaller communities or in cultural yeah. communities because often we're getting everybody in our community mm -hmm. calling us, right? And, and we're glad about that. And we also want to be making sure that we're doing our best by the folks that are reaching out um, and we're not like accidentally missing a step, exactly. right? Um, or, you know, I, uh, there's one million horrible <laughs> outcomes that could come from that, right? I'm thinking about like mm -hmm. two people ending up in the same support group, you know? Um, totally. So really doing our best to try to um, eliminate that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to switch gears here. Um, and again, it's not like if you didn't ask your question now, you can. You can ask it whenever you want. Um, we just like to make sure we pause. That's why we put those pictures in there. Um, so what we're going to do now is actually shift our focus to looking at and thinking through um, the way that our assessment tool is, is structured. And, and I'll just say this again briefly. We talked about this a lot more last session. Is that you know, we have developed a tool and a set of instructions that some of you have seen and some of you haven't. Um, and again, it's not a formula. It's a framework. We've, we've written the tool out where it has sections with individual suggested questions. But in the process of our work, we do not actually go through that like you would a typical screening, right? where you start with question number one and go to number two and all the way until you're finished. right? That we're actually really engaging in a process where I want to know from someone what led them to call. Right, first and foremost, because people aren't going to just call some random old person or, like for a lot of us, someone they might know and tell them something they might have never told anyone else or they might be super ashamed about or really afraid, right? That something generally happened that kind of pushed them to be willing to reach out in that way. And so we're really prioritizing in that first conversation going where they're taking us, right? That it, what someone tells me is their most important issue is their most important issue. And I can gather a lot of information um, that is really relevant to the assessment by you know, following their lead. And we know that there are particular areas that are important for us to gather information. And that's why our tool is developed into these specific sections. And so I would really highly encourage you to read if you look at anything, read the assessment tool instructions because that's really where it's at for us. Um, and we're going to kind of go through some examples here relatively quickly because the instructions actually have a lot of really good detail in them written down already and we wanted to prioritize using our time um, for things that you don't get out of a piece of paper. So like listening to Amaranthi and I um, role play and how we ask questions and, and you all being able to ask questions and things like that. So I just wanted to say that before we jump in. And so um, Amaranthi and I are going to take turns kind of going through these different sections and just giving you little examples um, before we jump into the role playing section. 
And so these first two pieces, um, we encourage people to consider throughout the course of the assessment. Um, the using privilege piece, what that means is, is looking for ways in which one partner is using the areas where they have more power in our culture. Right? So Amarinthi was talking about sexism and the way that men's power over women is privileged in our culture. Um, and they're using those identities and those access to resources to harm or coerce or intimidate someone else. And this one is pretty straightforward, I think, for all of us, because it's very consistent with how probably most of us were trained around domestic violence, at least how I was trained before I came here to the network, that generally people with a lot of positions of power can use that, right? They can use that um, to coerce or intimidate their partner. And the piece that for us is really interesting and I think is a little bit different is the ways that which someone can use their very own experience of vulnerability or being targeted in our culture to manipulate or coerce their partner. And so one of the examples that Amaranthi was sharing, I'm not sure when it was, like maybe it was earlier this week when we were talking about um, using vulnerabilities, the ways in which in our culture we have a perception that someone who has a disability, specifically a physical disability, there's no way they could be abusive, right? Because we have all these stories about how they are powerless, right? There's no way that if you aren't like physically able to dominate someone, how could you be abusive? We all know, we all know that abuse is far more than the hitting and the physical intimidation. And so when we see this using the vulnerabilities, one of the things we want to look at is how is someone using that very real vulnerability? So they're not making it up, mm -hmm. right? How can they use that very real vulnerability to coerce or to intimidate their partner into kind of being responsible for taking care of them, right? For being responsible for making their lives smaller to take care of someone else. Oh, and Courtney. Oh, hello again, Courtney from North Dakota. You were talking about we mentioned outing as a vulnerability or a way to isolate on Tuesday. Absolutely. So someone who um, is really exploiting the fact that we live in a culture that is homophobic, right, and transphobic, that that is a real thing, and expecting your partner to be able to um, kind of get in between you and life and, and to take the brunt of that is a way that we see people using their vulnerabilities around a pattern of coercive control. And, it, and sometimes that can also be, you know, preventing someone from being out, right, as well, or, or right. making them not be out, um, coercing them not to, for example. Um, we did talk a lot about that. Um, and these, th these um, anger and using physical violence, money and resources, these are just some other sections that we are often looking for when we're going through the assessment process. Um, and one of the things that I think is important to pull out or kind of give an example of is around anger and, and physical violence in particular. Um, but we know that with anger, you know, that's a very valid emotion, and that can be expressed in a lot of different ways for folks. And so the presence of anger alone doesn't necessarily mean that there's a pattern of power and control. Um, and so some of what we're looking for is whether or not anger is being used in a coercive way or in an intimidating way, or whether anger is prohibited. I think that's something that's kind of a unique thing that we might not often, or I know that for me, I didn't often think about in my previous DV experience. Um, and so an example of that that I have from my own work with survivors is just that there was a woman I had been talking to whose girlfriend you know, really forbid her to get angry around her because it triggered some of her past trauma. And so this is partially where it's overlapping a little bit with using vulnerabilities that we were just talking about. But what ended up happening over that global view of that relationship is that it became a constant source of, of disagreement, of fighting, and of control in the relationship to where the person who was being abusive in this case was, um, was the one dictating whether or not this person was angry or not, or that they were getting to be too angry and it was starting to, to affect them. Um, and so it was always determined by the other person and um, was, was always something that she felt so, you know, just completely um, um, nervous about ever expressing anything that could be resembling anger um, because of its impact on the other partner. Um, so that's just one example that was used um, in my work with folks. Um, and I think with um, physical violence, you know, one of the things there is that I think sometimes talking about context, we, we live in such a victim-blaming culture that I think sometimes talking about what's the context that physical violence was used might feel a little tricky to those of us in advocacy that really have our, you know, um, we're really attuned to when that victim blaming thing is happening. Um, and so we might feel like, well, we don't want context. We've heard a lot of context used to excuse abuse. Um, and so we really here are talking much more about, um, you know, the, the context of understanding why physical violence is happening actually really helps us understand 
um, better what's happening in the relationship, as well as, you know, if survivors are using violence as the process, as a way, as a strategy to survive a pattern of power and control, we really um, don't want to be having silence around that physical violence. Um, that just gives more room for someone who's battering to leverage that. So we have to be able to go towards that context of physical violence um, and, not, and not let our own assumptions about that kind of get in the way. Uh, because it, it does, um, it, it just gives us so much more about what the survivor is actually experiencing or what the caller, just what's going on for that caller. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's that part. Um, and then the next section here is speaking a little bit about fear and dread. Um, and I think, and, and lying as well. <laughs> um, but the main thing I wanted to focus on on this slide is just to talk a little bit about um, the differences between fear and dread and how we see those being um, useful in our work with folks. Um, and so one of the things that we know is that fear is, a, is similar to anger, is a feeling. And it's a feeling that everybody often has. And sometimes that fear um, can be a reaction. Oftentimes that fear is a reaction to one incident. It's not necessarily indicative of a pattern of power and control in a similar way that we just talked about with anger. And so one of the things that we really try to look for and ask questions about is more around dread. So dread is kind of this more pervasive feeling that may happen. It really gets at that 24-7 nature of a pattern of power and control that um, we really find to be a helpful, distinguish, a helpful way to distinguish between someone who's be, you know, feeling fear versus someone who feels dread to come home. And you know, an example of that is just someone that I was working with that had so much anxiety and nervousness about coming home and seeing their partner and being worried about what was going to happen, that it, there was a lot of avoidance and just a lot of um, just angst, almost in this felt way, even over the phone, about, about how they were feeling about even just seeing their partner and meeting up with them. Um, so that, that was something that was clearly much more indicative of other things that came out later in the assessment that also pointed to, to them being sur a survivor, but um, that was one in particular. I think Kristen's going to talk about a few other things. Um, I think okay. it's still, oh, it's still, still new. Me. Sorry about that. I, I'm still on. Great. We do like to share and take turns here. So keep going, though, Amber. Excellent. I'll keep going. Um, so the next few things here on this slide um, are some things around identities, making choices, and isolation. So um, one of the things that we really look for is how identities are supported or not supported in the relationship. Um, and that can mean identities around queer identity or identities around racial, ethnic, religious identities. Um, all of those are included. Um, and so one of the things we see quite a bit around this um, identity piece is or one of the things that I've seen a lot in my experience is um, someone who's trying to maintain a pattern of power and control is often um, you know, dictating what it means to be gay, what it means to be queer. Um, I've seen um, this used in particular ways of saying someone's not gay enough or that they're actually, um, maybe they're actually into dudes, they're not actually into women, for example, and then having so much control and coercion um, relate to that piece of their identity, right, and to kind of be attacking that uh, identity that they may be um, newly figuring out or they may be newly experiencing what it is to be gay. Um, and so that is a real vulnerable place for folks to be sometimes when they're first coming out or first experiencing that. Um, and then it, just a few things on the other ones. Making choices, um, you know, one of the things we're looking for is who, is who does have control over their own choices? Do both people get to freely decide what it is they want to be doing with their time or with their, um, do they get to spend time alone? Um, do they have to check in with their partner all the time before they do something? Um, are, they are their choices undermined or told that they're wrong or told that they're the wrong choice? Um, that, those are some things that we're looking for around that as well. And then isolation is pretty, something I think we're pretty familiar with around um, whose connections are undermined or not supported, um, and how does that look in the relationship. Thanks, Amarinthia. Sure thing. Um, and again, folks, feel free at any point if you want to add, like, oh, I see this in this way, or I've had this experience that you want to share with the group. Um, we love learning from you and just getting a chance to hear a little bit about what this is looking like in your programs as well. Um, so I'm just going to go pretty quickly through the last sections again. Um, a lot of this information is in the assessment tool instructions, and it's um, there's a lot of really good info in there, including some sample questions. Um, but we're also looking in these three areas. There's no real reason they all start with an S, but <laughs> um, there's some alliteration for you. Um, so we look at these areas, sleep, sex, and staying and leaving. Um, I'm actually going to talk about the bottom two really briefly. Um, so sex is a piece that I think um, is obviously profoundly <laughs> impactful. 
um, for all of our lives, right? Like we also live in a culture that doesn't really give a lot of us um, access to um, a sense of our own bodies being of our own control and for us and for people we choose to share it with. Um, and for a lot of folks, um, there is a really um, kind of unclear sense of of what is okay and not okay around our sex and sexuality and how that's being um, kind of used in a pattern of coercive control. So for a lot of folks that we're working with, the sense of like what sexual assault or what rape looks like is very specific, right? It's someone jumping out at you and forcing you um, to perform sexual activities against your will. And people are like, that's, I know that's not okay. But some of the things that happen in my relationship, they don't feel good, right? Like I said I wasn't interested in having sex and I ended up having it anyway because my partner wouldn't stop crying and telling me that they needed me to show them that I love them. Or I don't like the ways that I feel like I have to prove that I'm not cheating on my partner by having sex when I am actually not really interested in it. Right, so really helping people kind of work through that sense of like that spectrum around coercion as well and also being mindful that, you know, I don't ask those sets of questions right off the bat unless someone is sharing that that's a part of their experience because I think broadly there's a lot of shame around sex and sexuality and we want to build some rapport there as we're beginning to engage in that information and that's particularly important for us in working with LGBTQ people but I think is really um, kind of reflective across the board. Also, we're looking at this idea around staying and leaving. Um, this is a really big one, right? You know, we all know that it is rare for someone who is battering their partner to flee out a window with nothing, right? No shoes, no nothing. Like, I left everything behind, right? So that sense of, like, how someone has chosen to stay, how someone has chosen to leave, what that looks like, who gets to be in charge of that, what the consequences were are really, really important for us. Not saying, again, that we think everyone should leave their partners because that is a choice that everyone gets to make, right? And I think we as a field have been guilty at times of, saying, of, of, of our own humanity, <laughs> right? Of like, I am afraid for you, right? I am afraid of what you are saying because I am human and you are in danger. And we also know that that is the choice that someone gets to make and our responsibility is to do what we can to support them to lessen harm um, and have more access to choices and resources. But this idea of staying and leaving, who gets to do that, what are the contexts, is also really important. And lastly here, this idea of blame, guilt, and entitlement. You know, this idea of um, survivors uh, internalizing that it's their fault is not news for any of us, right? It's easy for a survivor to feel like something is their fault because someone tells you it's your fault all the time. So it's not a big leap, right? And so it can be disconcerting sometimes when people call us and they're like, nope, that's not my fault, that's their fault, right? It's a little bit inconsistent with our experience of survivors are just like, no, it's my fault, like that, that we've gotten so small in relationship to that harm. And so again, we're not saying if someone has self-blame, they're a survivor. If someone blames someone else, they're a batterer, right? We're trying to learn a little bit more about what's going on there. We know that people, based on different parts of their own identity and experience, feel more entitled to making choices about their own life, right? A lot of us have been told and shown in our families and our communities that we don't get to be in charge, right? And so it's not, again, like a, if yes, go down this path, and if no, go down this one. But we really want to be mindful of the ways that that intersects with um, that relationship and not just with how they interact or treat us, right? So if someone is, like, entitled with us, and what that means is, like, you know, maybe being bossy with us or saying, like, why don't you have this shelter bed? Isn't that what you people do? You know, just because they're being bossy to us doesn't mean that they're necessarily battering their partner, but it's also information, right, that we want to use as a part of our broader pattern of uh, assessment. Yeah, and I think this slide's just mostly talking about um, some examples of how you might ask that question around anger, for example, um, and, and particularly how you're going to ask um, questions about that caller's behavior as well, not just the behavior of their partner, but of their own behavior mm -hmm. too. And I think that one of the things that can be a challenge is that as a field, traditionally we've done a screening, right, that's really brief and often um, kind of crisis oriented because many people we're serving are in crisis. Um, and we're often asking someone, did this happen to you? Did this happen to you? Did this happen to you? And getting enough information that's consistent with surviving. We don't have as much practice asking someone about choices that they have made. Um, I think because, again, like what Amarantia was saying, we're really resisting this broader victim blaming culture and not wanting to perpetuate those um, kind of messages that say prove it. No, you prove it, right? And there being this like unmeetable threshold of like, 
you know, truth about someone's own experience. But as a part of the assessment, we have to ask those questions in a thoughtful and compassionate way that basically encourages someone to share more as opposed to feeling judged or kind of under that interrogator's flashlight, right? So now we're going to ask you a question here. So in the process of screening and assessment that you're doing right now, I know it probably looks different kind of across program to program, how are you engaging callers? So again, callers, not we don't know a lot when someone just first gives us a, a ring, to gather information that includes not only what happens to them, but what choices they make in their relationship. Is this something that you're doing? Is it something that's a little bit new? How's it going? This is probably more applicable to DV shelters since they have to assess a person's current situation and whether they're in crisis or not. Oh, so I can actually hear someone talking. Oh, no, I can too. <laughs> this, this never happens. Um, we usually are on lecture mode, and so I wasn't actually fully prepared to hear that comment. Could you repeat that, whoever it is that was talking? No pressure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like Melissa. Yeah, it looks like Melissa was saying I ask about their behaviors and responses. Absolutely. So it's a really simple thing, but it's something that maybe we don't often feel like we have the time to do or we feel apprehensive about doing because it makes us feel like, well then are they just going to feel like I don't believe them? Right? Because that's what one of the tools we use in that kind of crisis for baby formula and new clothes and a job. When you hear the tone, you will be the 12th person to join the meeting. We would have to unmute everyone and then mute uh, folks again. I wonder if it's the internet connection. It's interesting because I see that Sarah here, can, she can hear. Oh, they're saying that they can hear now. Okay. okay, so I guess we can keep going. How about everyone else? Everyone's got it. Okay, looks like we're getting good feedback from folks that you can hear us now. Awesome. Thanks everyone for chiming in about that and letting us know we're just yammering on and no one can hear us, so that's great. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, and mostly all I was saying here is of this slide is just kind of reading through this, that the content of the agreement are less important than how they were decided and who was able to actually share that about the um, agreements made. And then this is just a little reminder to that slide we talked about before as we go into some role plays, thinking about that local and global, what happened in the moment, you know, the who, what, when, where, as well as the big picture um, global view of the, of the changes in the relationship. Excellent. All right. Um, so here we go. Oh, that's our beautiful moms. Um, so we're going to shift gears here. Um, number one, thanks for everyone telling us that you couldn't hear us because we don't. We I can hear Amartya because she's like literally sitting across the <laughs> page. So it's a, it's a not a good gauge as to whether you all can hear us. Um, if something happens again, let us know um, because right now we're actually going to be doing some role plays where. Uh, it'll mostly just be listening, um, and that's going to be the biggest tool. And I think Sarah was just saying, and this is my experience too, that um, sometimes the Internet line can be a little bit more um, cutting in and out, and the phone line, at least in my experience, works a little better, so you can always dial in, and that information is on your um, login email that you got um, from Maritza's address. So what we're going to do right now is um, do some role plays for you, which hopefully you will enjoy. They're a 
<laughs> delightful for us, but also slightly um, nervous-making. It's true. We don't plan or prep any of it, really. I mean, we don't have like a. Thought, I mean, I mean, we, we plan, we plan it. but we don't have like a script we're following. Is what I mean. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. I was like, no, we're just like, hey guys, what do you hey, want to talk about to today? Exactly. <laughs> um, but what you know, I think one of the important things about this role play is that what Amaranthia is saying is true. That we want to do some. Um, truth to the role play that like I actually don't know what she's going to say and she doesn't know what I'm going to say and so that way we're trying to simulate a little bit more of a, a realistic situation um, that I don't have responses scripted to her and she doesn't to me either. So here's what we're going to do. You see three questions in front of you. Amaranthi and I are going to be doing two role plays and we're going to take a break in between. So on the role play, one of us is going to be the advocate and one of us is going to be the caller. So the first role play, Amarinthia is going to be our advocate. So she's going to be doing the assessment. So you'll be paying a lot of attention to what she's saying. And I'm going to be the caller. So I'm going to be sharing my story with Amarinthia, and she's going to be showing you in action some of the principles we've been talking about so far. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to look at these three areas. What do you notice about the advocate's language? So how is Amarinthia asking me questions? How is she reflecting back what I'm saying? What sticks out to you? And then we're going to do assessment issue spotting. So issue spotting is, do you see any of those areas that Amaranthi and I were just going over? So anger, or physical violence, or sex, or money and resources. Do you see any of those popping up? If so, you can make a little note if you have a little piece of paper by you. Um, and then when and how do you see the advocate engaging these two pieces? Okay. So just being able to get your brain in the like, oh, I see what she's doing here. I can see where we're going. Okay? So this is what you're going to do while we are rolling. And then we're going to come together, and we want to hear from you. What are some of your thoughts, some of your observations? Um, I was going to say sound good, but I can't hear you all. So I hope it's good. Um, okay. So you'll know that we're getting into our role play because Amarinthia will introduce herself as if she's answering the phone, like we all do every day, one million times a day. <laughs> all right. Northwest Network, Amarinthia. Hi. Um, I got your number from a friend, and she thought it might be a good idea if I gave you a call. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so glad you called. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what led up to you calling us today? Well, Things have just been really, really bad in my relationship for a while, and you know, I think my friend maybe feels worried, and I tell her it's not a big deal, but I mean, it's worse now than it was. So I, I don't actually really know what I want, I guess. But I, she just said that you guys might be able to help me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm really glad that you gave us a call, and sometimes people call us when they're, you know, having a time in their relationship or when things just aren't going as well as they did before, and it's totally normal to be able to call and talk to someone about that. Um, we do offer confidential services, and so um, I have some time right now. If now is a good time for you to talk, um, I'm an advocate here, and so um, I'd be happy to tell you a little more about what's been changing in your relationship and what's been happening. Okay. So you said that it's gotten a little bit worse now. Can you tell me a little bit about what's, what's been getting worse in your relationship? Yeah, you know, my partner and I are just fighting a lot more. Things have been really, really stressful. You know, I lost my job about three months ago, and it's just been really difficult financially. And I've really, really been trying to, like, find work, and I've been, like, cobbling little things together, like dog walking and babysitting and stuff. But I'm really struggling, and my partner, you know, I am, I am leaning on them. Mm -hmm. you know, to pay for our house. And I know that wasn't what we agreed to in the first place, but I really am trying the best I can. And, you know, it's just I know that maybe I'm not being as grateful as I could be or I don't know. But, you know, we just end up fighting about it all the time. Mm -hmm. What are some of the fights when you all are fighting? What, is that, what does that fighting look like? Or what are some things that um, that happen a lot when you're fighting with each other? You know, I think... A lot of the times my partner just gets really upset, starts crying, you know, talking about how stressed she is about money. And, like, mm -hmm. I can tell, like, it's really hurting her. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that me ha having a job is hurting her. And, I, you know, I tell her I promise I'm going to find something, and I'm trying so hard. And she just talks about how she just feels used by me and that I'm just taking advantage of her. And, you know, I really i am not, but... 
you know, and then it'll end up just turning into something else about how, you know, if I would work harder, if I would ask my parents for money, and, you know, I, I'm not... I'm not in that kind of relationship with them, and, mm-hmm. and she just gets really pissed off. Mm-hmm. What does her getting pissed off look like? Well, you know, it's, it's it can be a little bit scary sometimes. I mean, mm-hmm. she just starts yelling, and you know, mostly yeah. it's yelling and just yeah. calling me names, and you know, I'm yelling too. I don't, yeah. I don't want to be in this kind of a situation with someone. Yeah, yeah, totally. What are some of the things that, that she's yelling, and what are some of the things that you've yelled before? Well, she mostly just calls me ungrateful and lazy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know, maybe I've just brought up some stuff about the past, about how, like, there was a time when she wasn't working and I, you know, was supporting us, and I don't know why she's making such a big deal out of it. And I know it is a big deal, you know, but I think it's just like I can't ever win, mm-hmm. you know. I can't ever do anything different. Mm-hmm. And so I just tell her she's got a short memory, I guess. Yeah. And how long about just some of the fights? You know, it sounds like there's a lot of arguments sometimes happening, and it, it's a stressful time, you know, it sounds like around money. Um, but how about how long are some of the arguments taking and – you know, do you ever feel like they get resolved pretty much? I mean, sometimes we'll be up all night, okay. you know, and I can tell that, like, I mean, I don't. I want to be able to go to bed, and I often mm-hmm. will say, like, look, we need to be done. I cannot keep doing this. And she's like, we can't go to bed angry, mm-hmm. you know, and then I end up not sleeping, mm-hmm. you know, and she's just like, look, I don't get a day off. You don't you just opt out of this conversation. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, I get tired, and it, it's just worse. And I just act in ways that I feel like crap about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes they get resolved, but mostly it's because we're exhausted. And mm-hmm. then I just promise her that I'll do better, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what are some of the agreements that you all made around, um, you know, when you lost your job and um, were going to be looking for work? Was there any conversation about about what kind of time that would be or – just was there any conversation about how to get through that that job not having a job? No, I mean okay. I just I've just been looking. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think getting the word to end it there, so we're gonna pause. <laughs> um, thanks, Amarinthia. Oh sure. <laughs> there are lots of other places I could go, but yeah. Well, we can talk about that right. in a moment. Yeah, just in the interest of time, we're gonna Perfect. get to the questions here. So Hi, both. Just a moment. Let me interrupt for a second here. I'm not sure if this is from your end. So I'm not sure if it's uh, that you're both uh, listening from different phones in the same location, but we were hearing some background noise. I think it so, is. So um, oh. folks were putting comments about that. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. We are actually in the same room quietly together. I think it might be coming from uh, an unmuted phone. I'm not sure, Cassie, if you were able to get the – um, whole conference muted, but we are in a room together without any background noise. Okay, okay, just wanted to double check. Thank cool, you. Thanks. Um, and if folks can just like mute their own phones, if you're on a cell or if you're at your desk and you have a mute button, that would be awesome. Um, thanks for letting we did us hear, so we, we did hear the role play. It was just like there was some okay. background. <laughs> you don't have to do it again. It'd be terrible if we were like, oh man, uh, just enroll and no one could hear us. <laughs> All right, so this question here, folks, let's bring your attention back to the slide. So in the assessment issue spotting, what content areas of the assessment did you see come up in the role play? So some helpful tools about muting. What about the role play, if folks were able to hear? What were some of the areas that you noticed Amarinthia engaging in that we had went over? So sleep was one. Mm -hmm. What else? Mm -hmm. Financial abuse, yep. Not letting her sleep. Mm-hmm. So we've got money and resources, sleep. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Were there things that you were noticing, Amarinthia? There were definitely some things around. So Romy says it too: emotional abuse, berating, guilt. Um, I think that um, some of the things I was noticing was just some of the things around how they're fighting, and so anger or yelling. What kind of things were? I was curious about what kind of things were they saying? You know. Grateful and lazy were some things that the caller mentioned, but I also was curious about, you know, she said that she yelled sometimes too and called her name too, and so that was going to be another place to try to go to um, potentially was, um, you know, what is she saying to her partner? 
Right, and so Kayla's saying making choices, name calling, and Luis, you asked a good question, is there a content area slide to choose from? We don't have one that's all on one sheet, so you can either just you know, recall of what you can remember or just shout out these kind of areas that you noticed so they don't have to be the exact same thing. Um, and then to this question, um, when and how did you see the advocate, that's Amarinthia, um, movie versus a snapshot, and then context, intent, and effect? And Romy, was, you were adding a point here, the yelling by the caller seemed to be defensive rather than offensive. So did you see Amarinthia going beyond just the like, specific little tidbit of information? Oh, right, absolutely. So Margaret shared a really good question. What does fighting look like in your relationship? And Wendy was saying, how were our conflicts resolved? I know as a caller, one of the things I noticed, this is a really um, good tool as an advocate is asking for an example, mm -hmm. right? So like, you know, what, are, what does one of your typical arguments look like? Or what is the, the most um, challenging relationship or um, conflict look like, you know, recently? Mm -hmm. To get someone to give you um, that snapshot to build out into that movie. Anything about context, intent, and effect? Did you see anything in there, Amarinthia? Yeah, I mean, I think the overall context of the um, of the money and the work and kind of the the pressure of that, um, you know, was sort of definitely looming, just like this larger picture of the finances of the house um, or of their relationship. Um, let's see, intent and effect. I think certainly some of this was around um, the impact that that was having on the caller of being um, the pressure of that of being like called ungrateful and she's really trying and trying to contribute, um, you know, that was definitely something that spoke to mm -hmm. some, some pieces of those, but yeah. Yeah, and Sarah was saying here, do you have an agreement about money? Uh -huh. So that's trying to get to the sense of like, did you make a plan or was it like mm -hmm. you're never going to be able to win? Because I mean, any of us who've been unemployed, it's like, you, like yeah. you're in charge of how long that lasts, <laughs> right? Like that's a little bit of something that's outside of our control and yet it was supposed to be in this caller's control mm -hmm. to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to shift gears back to that first slide, and we're going to do another role play. Um, and I did just hear for like a little bit of a blip, maybe when you were talking, Amarinthia, mm -hmm. a little bit of that background noise again. And okay. so it's a, just a reminder, star six to mute yourself. Or if you're on a phone that has a mute button, just hit the mute button. Um, that way we'll do our best to make sure that everyone can hear. Um, are you ready, Amarinthia? I think I'm ready. Okay, yeah, great. Um, so Amarinthia is going to be the caller this time, and I'm going to be the advocate. Uh, Northwest Network, this is Kristen. Hi there. Yeah, I'm giving a call because I, um, I think I need some help. I, my girlfriend and I had a fight last night, and um, I ended up like slapping her in the face, and I just, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what to do. It's kind of freaking me out. Yeah. Well, I'm really, really glad that you reached out. Um, can I ask your name? Yeah, my name's Kylie. Hi, Kylie. My name is Kristen. Hi, um, or is it safe for you to talk right now? I have a little bit of time if you want to talk a little bit more about what happened last night. Yeah, I have some time now. It's a good time. I'm on a like work break, and okay. um, yeah, I can chat for okay. a bit. So, Kylie, you mentioned that last night you it sounds like had a fight with your partner and you ended up slapping her. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like that's feeling pretty overwhelming right now. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what what was happening that led up to that. Yeah, so we were just fighting a lot and just, like, a lot of yelling and, you know, just, like, name-calling. And I just was trying to, like, get her to stop talking at me. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to get her to shut up, really. And she just kept going on and on and on. And so I slapped her. And I don't know if our neighbors heard. We were fighting pretty loud. I'm glad the cops weren't called because that just would have been a mess. Yeah. Is, is this the first time you've ever slapped your partner? Um, yeah, this is the first time I've ever slapped her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's the first time. It's the first time anything like that's happened. Um, you mean like any time there's ever been any kind of like physical force or yeah, violence? Yeah, yeah. totally. I, I mean, mean there's been like pushing and shoving, but like not anything like, you know, contact with mm -hmm. her face or anything like bad like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so you were saying that you were fighting a lot and you were yelling, you were name calling. What was the fight about? Yeah, so we... I don't even know. Like, sometimes I don't even know what we're fighting about. It just gets mm -hmm. this place that's, like, we're back and forth around in circles. But mostly what prompted it, I think, was, like, she's always saying that she's, that I'm, like, going to cheat on her, and she's always saying this stuff about how I'm really, like, 
totally, you know, I identify as bisexual, and she sometimes totally gets on to me about how I'm looking at other guys or looking at other girls and that she can't trust me. And, you know, we were out, we went out, to, out to dance last night, and, um, you know, there was nothing that was going on where I was just being friendly with friends of ours, like people we hang out with. Mm-hmm. And she just started flipping out and making a scene and yelling at me that I was just like this, like I couldn't just, I couldn't like make up my mind and, you know, um, that I was just like indecisive about who I wanted to be with and yeah. wanted to have it both ways and all this stuff. And it just, and then that just led into more yeah. fighting. So did the fight happen in public or were you elsewhere? Yeah, it started in public. Um, some of the yelling and screaming happened like at the bar, uh-huh. at the club we were at. Um, and, and then, then it, and then we left. Like we just got out of there and and then it started and then it kept going at night when we got home. And you said there was a lot of yelling and name calling. Was that name calling towards you or you towards her or both? A little bit of both. Yeah, a little bit. What of were both. some of the things that she was saying? Well, she was saying that I was like this jealous, like horny person and that she can't trust me and I'm just lying all the time about, you know, that I'm a liar and you know, I don't know. She was calling me some pretty nasty names. Um that I just really hurt, you know, they're hurtful. And yeah. so she was calling me a whore and, like, just saying all this stuff about, you know, that I'm not a good partner and um, that I'm not really gay enough and, yeah. you know, all that stuff. And I, you know, I was saying stuff too. I mean, I was trying to get her to stop yelling at me. And What were some of the things that you said? Yeah, I was saying, like, you know, you're always on my case about this. Like, just leave me alone about it. You know, like, like just stop talking to me, I need a break, like, stop yelling at me, you know, I haven't been in a lot of relationships before, but I just, it's just really intense. And so when you, it sounds like the first, this is the first time that things got to a point where you said, like, there was any kind of physical force that, like, Mm -hmm. was, like, a hitting, right? You said there was some pushing and shoving. So when you hit her, was there, was there something you were hoping that would do? Yeah, I think I was hoping... I mean, that's a good question. I think I was hoping that she would just stop calling me a whore. And I think I was just hoping that it would kind of shock her. I honestly, it happened, I mean, I've never done anything like that and in my relationship with people. And I guess I was just thinking it would, I guess I was hoping it would just end it, you know, like it would just stop. Did it end it? It did for a second. Um, It did for a second. She was kind of shocked and really surprised and, and then I felt really awful that I had done that. And then she, um, and then she kind of like went into yelling at me more and talked about how I needed to, I should leave. And um, you know, it was just screaming and yelling at me like the same way before, mm-hmm. as before. Um, and then just told me to like get out. Yeah. And, Have you talked to her since? Um, I haven't talked to her since. No. And how do you feel about you know? If you are planning on being in contact with her or hoping to be in contact with her, how do you feel about this next kind of moment after what happened last night? Yeah, I don't feel very good about it. I mean, I don't even know what she's going to say about th- or do about this. You know, like it's it's never happened before, and um, I don't know. I feel kind of – I feel really uneasy about it. I don't know yeah. what she's going to say or do. Yeah. I, I've been kind of avoiding it, like not wanting to talk to her. Oh, thanks, Amaranthia. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, one of the things we do when we're role playing is not look at each other because mm-hmm. then sometimes we get the giggles, which is helpful, <laughs> just because it's funny to be kind of play acting with your coworker. Um, so I just had to like wave at her. Um, so here we are again, and we're going to go back to these questions. Thanks, Amaranthia. That was really great. Sure, yeah. um, so going back to this assessment issue spotting. Um, so again, Luis. Like Luis was saying earlier, I mean, it just kind of psychically, there you were again. Um, it's okay if you don't remember the exact issue, but just like what did you see? What were the kind of areas of importance um, that popped up for you in that conversation? So Melissa was saying that I asked what was happening when Kylie slapped her partner. She was finding out who the primary aggressor was. So, um, you know, it sounds like Kylie was pushed to the limit and slapped her partner. Yeah, so when I asked that question, we got more information about that incident. You know, and the the term, I'm just going to make a little aside. The term primary aggressor is one that is often um, really rooted and embedded in the legal system. And one of the things we know is that broadly, um, the legal system is not a friendly place for a lot of marginalized communities. Um, and when we are doing this process around assessment, 
we're certainly sometimes coming up with that information that would fit into a primary aggressor model, but what we're really trying to do is get like the big picture to see if there's a pattern there. And so just to um, kind of clarify that um, often there's a lot of like training around primary aggressor assessment, um, and that is a really important tool and skill for a lot of law enforcement, and what we're doing is a little bit outside of that. But I think absolutely your comments there, Melissa, were right on about what you were noticing. Um, Romy was talking about concerns about infidelity, anger, name calling, identities, fear and dread. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were really, I mean, yeah, Amarithi was, was really <laughs> packing it in there. <laughs> nice work. Yeah. So you, there was a lot in there, right? So I think that using her identities that Margaret was, was sharing is that, like, that was a huge part of the conflict, right, with this using this, like, really negative stereotypes about bisexual people yeah. and just, like, using that as, like, an excuse to control someone and accuse them of cheating and all that stuff. And it's such a potent, you know, those identity, I mean, it's just such a potent thing that's so so powerful. Yeah, yeah and that Romy was saying that, like, a pattern of physical abuse. So, you know, it's interesting sometimes people's definition of, like, what counts as violence is different than ours, mm-hmm. right? So, like, there was a distinction with the caller about the hitting was very different than all the pushing and shoving, mm-hmm. right? And I would, had we been on, like, a one-hour-long conversation, <laughs> I would want to learn about that, mm-hmm. Um and trying to get a sense of like, you know, when you were you hit your partner, were you like, I just wanted her to shut up, I wanted her to stop yelling at me, I wanted to scare the crap out of her, right? She was able to give me something that was actually relatively consistent with a survivor's experience of using violence. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts about this next question? When and how did you see the advocate, which was me this time, um, engaging the movie versus the snapshot and the context, intent, and effect? I think a handful of you have, have been integrating that. Um, Melissa and uh, other folks in your responses already. So we're seeing some of that, especially the last comment here from Margaret as well. Yeah, Yeah, that was a great one. What were you hoping for when she hit her partner? Mm -hmm. So that's really to the intent. Mm -hmm. What else? Any other thoughts about these questions? Any reflections you have, Amaranthia, of what you were hoping to communicate? Yeah, I was definitely leaning towards this being a survivor using violence and kind of um, trying to get at some of the ways that um, we've already talked about that survivors often are using violence sometimes, um, you know, get a break or have it stop or, you know, things like that. Um, And I was going to throw in there if we had time, you know, some alcohol usage as well since we were at a bar and just that there could have been a lot of, Mm -hmm. you know, we see that quite a bit that sometimes alcohol is being used. Um, yeah, and Lisa is saying here too, just was this the first time, um, right. or were there more? So getting at that larger picture, um, that larger movie, as opposed to just that one incident. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, folks. Feel yeah. free to add any other thoughts in here. We're going to move on just because we've got about 15 minutes left, um, and we wanted to cover a little bit more. Oh, that's nice. Wendy was saying that um, she noticed the tone of my voice, um, neutral and friendly. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that I think is an important part of the assessment, um, I think, for all of us that we try to cultivate in our direct services work that, I mean, people tell you some stuff that yeah. if I were just, like, hearing it, I might have a reaction that's very different than what I would want to share in my voice with someone. Mm-hmm. What we don't want to do is, like, shame anybody yeah. um, or come across as judgmental, right? And so we um, – yeah, absolutely, Wendy, yeah. Amaranthi <laughs> did a great job as well for the first one. Um, that we are really working to create a context where in which someone is feeling like I'm sharing information and I'm responding to questions that are based in uh, grounded yeah. curiosity, mm-hmm. yeah, about what's going on in my life and what I might need and how I might feel about it. Mm-hmm. And certainly we did a condensed version for the sake of time, but we would we would usually go into a little bit more of an explanation about, you know, here's what we typically talk, you know, we're going to be asking you some detailed questions and it's now a good time to talk, you know, and a little bit more about confidentiality, all those things. But um, for the sake of time, we didn't do all of yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was more the assessment skills. Mm-hmm. And so we did, we did talk about that a little bit last, I was going to say last week, but it was last session. <laughs> um, so this is another little tip, and we talked about this last time. We did a couple of exercises about um, question language. That didn't come out right. The um, a way we ask questions, because I mean, all of us probably have that experience of like the way that someone asks us a question impacts how we feel about it mm-hmm. and how we respond, right? So if someone's like, "Why did you do that?" I might be like, "Well, because I did," <laughs> and not in a way that I'm just like sharing instead of defending, right? And so we often use this tip about asking, like, do ask what and don't ask why. But as as human people, we are, like, 
wired to ask why. So we actually have to resist the why and come up with, tell me, give, can you give me an example? How were you feeling? What came up for you? Um, because why is much more direct. Mm -hmm. And also we know that sometimes it doesn't make people feel like, oh, I'm, I want to get in here with someone and share some vulnerable um, information. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really open the conversation up. You know, it's just like someone could say, because I wanted to. And that's mm -hmm. it. You know, the <laughs> other ones kind of, you know, they help you open it up a little bit more. Yeah, and Margaret was just sharing, Amaranth in the chat, that um, asking why can seem victim blaming. Totally. And that's the thing where it's like we run that, um, so if you imagine there's like a little, here I'm going to draw it, um, that there's like a little thing that we're walking on. And there's these valleys right here. So there's like victim blaming here. And then there's totally just like excusing everyone's behavior, mm -hmm. right? Which is like whatever you need to do, whatever you need to do over here. And then over here is why did you do that? You know, what did you do to cause it? All that stuff. We don't want to be on either one of these, right? We want to stay up here. And up here is when we're going to ask someone a question that feels respectful, but that isn't just like, oh, whatever you needed to do, whatever you needed to do, or why did you do that, mm -hmm. right? Because neither of them are actually like supporting someone's self-determination, mm -hmm. right? Because telling someone you did that because you had no choice, like that's not actually supporting someone to be in the world in a way that is going to get them more connected to a life they want to have. Oh, thanks, Heidi. Mm -hmm. I know, I really, I'm, I'm missing my uh, calling here as a webinar <laughs> illustrator. <laughs> um, anyway, otherwise I would just describe it to you. Okay, so... Um, we're going to talk a little bit here about um, a praxis lesson from our work in engaging in um, the process of assessment over, you know, it's been maybe 27 years that we've been doing um, a process of assessment. It's evolved over time. Um, but there's some lessons that we've learned that we want to share with you um, because they were things we had to learn in a little bit the hard way. Um, so for us, one of the things we know is that Many, many, many people who are surviving a pattern of coercive control have done things that they're ashamed of. Mm -hmm. I would say probably, we could I mean, probably say everyone, everybody, right? Think, yeah. mm -hmm. And that many survivors have done something, quote unquote, on the wheel. And what we mean by the wheel is the power and control wheel, right? And that many survivors have used violence to resist abuse. Mm -hmm. This is actually really, really consistent with the way that we interact with people in our programs every day, at least here at the network. Is this something that you all see? Do you see folks that you're working with having shared either at the beginning or maybe not until way, way, way later mm -hmm. that they've done something that they're ashamed of? Or they've done something that you might have categorized in the past as, and I'm using air quotes here, um, a, a batterer's tactic or an abusive behavior. But you're actually like, no, they were surviving. Mm -hmm. Um, and have you worked with survivors who've used violence in the course of surviving? Add your thoughts into the chat. Almost always, sounds like. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So this is, yeah. yeah, and I think that what you're saying, Melissa, is super important, right? That like sometimes they're afraid to tell me about it. And the reason they're afraid to tell us about it is that we as a field and as a movement have developed, because we live in a victim-blaming culture, mm -hmm. a very narrow representation of what it's like to survive into partner violence. Mm -hmm. And the little story, that very narrow story of like a woman with a male partner mm -hmm. hiding in a corner, covering her face, never having done anything bad or because they were pissed or lying or stealing. I mean, how many times we know people are like, I'm taking some money and we can be like, sure, go ahead and do that. That's what you're doing to stay safe. But we are not going to put that on our newsletter, mm -hmm. right, in a survivor story. And so what we haven't done is create space for people to feel like you can have done that. You can have done this thing that you're ashamed of or you can have used violence and you get to tell us how you feel about that, mm -hmm. right? And we're not just going to be like, whatever you did, you did whatever you had to do. You know, that I think in some ways it, it avoids that one side of the valley that shames someone for even experiencing violence at all. But it doesn't help someone figure out, like, well, I may not be, you know, responsible for the whole spectrum of coercion and control in my relationship, I don't like how I feel about what I did. And can I figure out how I might want to do something different 
maybe in this relationship, maybe in another relationship in the future. And so we have to be willing to show up. And I think that, Wendy, your point is also super important. It's a way that the abuser can control the victim, Absolutely. right, because they see that shame. Often people are like, the only person who knows I did this is who? The person battering them. Right? It's yeah. the person battering them. And so it's like they know how bad I am. If you knew how bad I was, you would never help me. And that's the thing. When we start asking the questions, we have to be able to show up for the answers. And that's what happens in these more comprehensive assessments is that people start sharing some of this stuff because we're asking them. Mm -hmm. And we have to be really mindful about how we engage with that information. And so this is a little bit of a list of some of the things that happens when we ignore what survivors do. But we're actually going to focus on about some of the things we need to be mindful of when we are actually getting that information. And so for us, in a response to someone who's sharing that they have used violence in the course of surviving, that we are asking them how they feel about that, mm -hmm. right? And that we're actually thinking about the fact that safety planning with someone, with a survivor who's used violence, is actually talking about what other choices might be available to you. Because one of the things we know is that regardless of whether you are, are a survivor in every way, shape, and form, if you use violence, like hitting, or like that slap that Amarinthia was sharing, you are vulnerable to arrest. Mm -hmm. right? And that is a big deal for people. right? It can be something that ends their relationship with their kids. It makes it profoundly difficult to navigate the world. right? Um, I'm just reading Louise's comment here, um, victims here that I too would say, well, that's what you get. Absolutely, right? I'm sure they've already heard it before, and this is why they might try to avoid what they've done, right? Like people are desperate for something when they call us, right? Whether it's just understanding or breaking that isolation or re like a place to go. You know, one of the things we want to do is create a context where people feel like they can share their whole selves and they're not like secretly hiding the things that they're ashamed of and worrying they're not going to be able to get the kind of support that we're providing. Mm -hmm. And so for us, when we're using this approach, we have to practice praxis. And what that means is, and praxis is this idea of doing something, reflecting on how it's going, and then making adaptations and, and trying something new with that information you gather, right? So as you're shifting your orientation around screening and assessment to maybe something that looks a little bit different, it's important that you build in some opportunities to get feedback from your hotline volunteers or the folks that are um, uh, I just lost my train of thought, sorry, <laughs> that's okay, um, that we're getting that information and incorporating it into like what's working, what isn't working, that we're doing this movie, not the snapshot, that we're talking with our coworkers, we're debriefing in an intentional way, we're checking our assumptions, right, so we're not saying like, oh, you did that thing, you must be a better, oh, you did that thing, or that thing happened to you, you must be a survivor, right, we're actually like, okay, I want to know more, I want to figure out what's happening here. And this last piece is an important one, do not document in files. What we mean by that is um, that packet that you either have or will get, that's like our little you know, simulation of a tool that we don't actually use in practice, it's just a good framework, um, don't fill it out and put it in someone's file. And the reason we don't want to do that is that you may be documenting people using illegal behaviors. Mm -hmm. right? You may be documenting, you know, this person used an illegal substance, or you know, this person hit their partner. Um, and it's important that we're not potentially endangering someone um, by writing information in our files that um, could possibly be damaging if subpoenaed. And so just for your information, the network gets funding all the way from our city, all the way up to the feds. We are also a class of grantee. Um, and we have documentation practices that meet um, all of the requirements of our funders. And so we're not saying like, don't write anything down. We have to write things down. We know that. Um, and we want to be really thoughtful about what we're writing down so that we're not unintentionally um, creating conditions of harm for someone. Mm -hmm. um, any questions from folks? So this is a little bit of a question. We just have a couple of minutes left. Um, and this is a question about how you're currently screening people. And I guess even aside from this question, I would ask you a little bit um, maybe to focus on these here and any thoughts you might want to share. These are some questions for you to ask yourself, not necessarily right now, um, but to take back to your staff meeting or to your team. Um, what are some of the barriers for your organization right now to engage in more thorough assessments? Maybe it's that you don't have enough staff or you don't have enough time. What are some of the strengths of how you deliver services? So maybe you know that you have a lot of trust in the community, that you've got a lot of skillful and compassionate advocates. 
And then what support would your organization need to integrate assessment analysis or practice into the way that you're doing you know, screening, and I use that term loosely, um, for your services? Any thoughts or reflections about these three areas or anything in general in our last few minutes together? And AT, is there anything you wanted to, I mean, just feel free to jump in if you have anything yeah, you want to share. Totally. I'm going to drink some water. Great. Oh. <laughs> So it sounds like some things around um, more efficiencies around uh, reporting and documentation and um, you know having some more efficient systems to help with that. Um, funding cuts, yes, agreed. That is definitely <laughs> a factor for so many of us and so many programs. Um, it can make it hard to feel like you can spend the time you would like um, to, in order to um, with the funding constraints that people uh -huh. are under. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I appreciate everyone sharing these things. The time and staff um, is an issue as well. It seems like kind of a theme. And it's really important for us to think about, um, you know, what are the processes that we're doing, and is there any way to increase efficiency where we can? You know, all of us are in a position of, of experiencing cuts, and it, it does impact our ability to do a lot of different things. Um, Aida was saying staff, staff, and more staff. Um, I wish we could just have more and more staff. That would make all of our lives easier, right? Um, and that, you know, we really want to be mindful that we're not saying, like, if you're not doing this exact thing, then you're not doing a good job. There's a lot that you can just incorporate in, even if you're doing your same old screening, in how you ask the questions. Right? Like that can really give you more insight into what someone might end up um, needing or wanting, you know, that you might be able to get information about a resource you wouldn't have had otherwise, mm -hmm. right? That you can help that person feel more connected and supported. Mm -hmm. um, so here we are, one minute away. Last little bit of time. <laughs> For those of you that are, um, there's like a handful of folks, Amarinthia, who were on last week's session. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. So Heidi, you're, uh, yes, as a really good and gigantic question. Um, can you talk briefly about best practices when you can't determine who is a survivor from the very beginning? Um, I'll say one thing in the name, Ruthie, if you have anything to say. I know it's 1.30, so it may actually be something that um, maybe I have both of us write a little bit about and we send via email. Um, there are a lot of responses to this question, yes. one of which is um, some people aren't in an abusive relationship. We get people, because we do community-based programs that are not just for DV survivors, we do relationship skills and we're out tabling in community talking about lots of things like how to be a good parent. Um, sometimes there isn't a pattern, right? So we're looking for the pattern. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things are really confusing, uh -huh. right? And Relationships so, are complex and messy and yeah. And so I think it might actually be beneficial for us, maybe Amarinthia, I think if you have time in the next couple of days, that we're actually going to take this question and maybe just like reflect upon it yeah. and then maybe do some writing that we can share with people just because we don't have um, much time left now or really any time <laughs> left um, to address that. But Heidi, I think that that is a really, really important question that you raise and I, one that I think um, we would both like to do some um, good sharing on in a time that we had some um, space to do that. Um, so just on that note, it's uh, just a minute after 1.30 and we want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time. Um, so you can contact Amarinthia or myself. Here's our email addresses. You can call us at the office. Um, and probably, oh, it's Thursday. Yeah. Um, so it's likely that um, Amarinthia and I will be following up via email with people probably on Monday um, where what I'll send slides from today. I'll send the tool and the instructions. And then Amarinthia and I will hopefully have an opportunity to uh, reflect on Heidi's really important question and get that into the content and the body of the session. And one last announcement I wanted to make was um, on November the 5th, the network is offering a webinar that is at the same time on um, immigration options for LGBTQ survivors of DV, SA, and stalking. Um, and we're working with an attorney who's presenting on that whose area of expertise is LGBTQ communities, domestic violence, and immigration law. Um, but it's, it's set up for advocates, so you don't have to be an attorney. And I just am excited about it, and I want to tell people to sign up.
Um, so thank you, Cassie, and thank you, Heidi, for um, your support and for inviting us here today. And thank you, everyone, for really, really thoughtful um, questions and comments throughout the session today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so much for a great presentation. And also to complicate things, when you uh, think about the answer to that question, I was also thinking about those that have policies in place or practices in organizations that first come, first serve kind of basis. Mm -hmm. And what happens when the determination, the assessment is incorrect? I think that too. So I'm just right. using my privilege that I have I'm able to talk to you directly, so to ask that question too. So please also um, let us know about that, what to do in that case. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Were you going to say something? Oh, I just said I wrote it down. <laughs> Yes, that's another, the other side of that, when uh, the determination of who is a survivor is incorrect, and then we learn later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Yeah. So much. Please don't forget to fill out the evaluation that you're going to receive as you exit out from this webinar, and we'll be in touch. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.